You're watching the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast, and on this episode, we're joined by Boss Gil Rood, former flight leader for the Blue Angels. Boss Rood's going to tell us all about his brand new memoir and what it was like to grow up in a one-room schoolhouse in a remote farming town in North Dakota to being named the commanding officer of the Naval Flight Demonstration Squadron. Boss Rood's also going to discuss the Blue Angels' transition from the A-4 Skyhawk to the F-18 Hornet, including some very dark days that almost saw the transition canceled. Later on in the podcast, Boss Rude is going to share some fond memories, including the impact that the original Top Gun movie had on air show audiences and what it was like to fly over Super Bowl XXII. So please join me in welcoming Boss Gil Rude to the podcast. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Notoff, and I'm pumped to be joined today by retired Navy captain, former leader of the Blue Angels, the man that actually led the Blue Angels transition from the A4 Skyhawk to the F-18 Hornet, and now an author of a brand new memoir, Boss Gilrude. Thank you for making time to chat with me today. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I'm happy to be here. Uh, well, I- I'm happy to have you. In fact, uh, my last guest on this podcast, John Gucci Foley, flew with the 92 Blue Angels, uh, did that famous trip over to Moscow. We were talking about his early part of his career, and your name came up, and he mentioned you as a legend. And after I've now read your memoir now twice, I have to agree with his assessment. And so I um, wanted to share about your memoir with my audience because it's one of the best books I've read. It's called From the Prairie to the Pacific, A Blue Angel's Journey. It comes out September 1st. I'm going to include a link in the description below. Uh, but Boss Root, I'm not blowing smoke when I say it's one of the best books I've read. And, and for a number of reasons, I want to share that here before I pass it over to you. But one, obviously, you have a legendary career. And so there is a healthy dose of naval aviation and and Blue Angels here that is very insightful in the book. So uh, even if you're a hardcore fan like me and feel that you know everything, uh, this book is just filled of stories I've never heard before. And in fact, I will tell you, there are a couple of stories that made my jaw drop and give Boss Root a call. And uh, I, I said, Boss Root, are you sure you want to tell that story? And unapologetically, uh, Boss Root said, hey, that's the way it happened. It's staying. And I was like, that a boy. And then uh, the other thing I really like about the book is just how open and candid you are about your career. I mean, you talk about the challenges and you even talk about some of the lowlights and uh, you do a great job dissecting those and really extracting out the lessons learned for the reader, which also I think just brings the book up to that next level. So uh, Boss Rude, from your perspective, want to hear about the book, what you want readers to take away. And, and quite frankly, I want to hear about the process because you're not an author by trade, but the book is so authentically in your voice. Uh, it's, in, it's entertaining, a page turner. So I'll throw it over to you. Well, the incentive was COVID. You know, here I am uh, st- stuck in my office. I decided, well, you know, I need to probably pass down some stuff and then stories and things and, uh, to my grandkids. You know, I'm getting over. You know, who knows how long I got left here. So, uh, by the way, at the beginning, I encourage all. I've got so many friends that have better stories than mine to tell, and they need to get on with it because it's not that hard once you get started. And so uh, once I got started, I looked and I started, my, my wife actually uh, listened and she said, what's, what's wrong? I was in, in my office and I started giggling and carrying on in there and she said, what's so funny? I said, I'm just reliving stuff from when I was a kid and I was a wild child. Okay, that's part of the book that goes through there. And so, you know, when you, when you start that back that early and you remember some of the things you did as a kid and you go, oh my God, I we can't believe we lived through that because there were no helmets. There was no safety gear. There was nothing. We were just let loose, you know, to go play and do stuff. And so there were a lot of adventures there that uh, I managed to share. I did not keep a journal. Okay. That's not necessary. If you look back, I uh, used the log books. I have all my log books for flying purposes. I had my high school annuals, college annuals, and then, of course, cruise books to look at. And if you really get stumped on something, you just Google it. <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised what you can find. Uh, the, the style I used as I went in there was uh, to tell stories. So it, it's a vignette format. And uh, it just goes from the beginning, basically, when I was born in North Dakota, 10 miles from the nearest town. I, wasn't, I was actually born in town, but I grew up 10 miles from the nearest town. And then it progresses through, you know, how in the world can a kid from a one-room country school out in the country with one teacher for all eight grades, how can he progress from that to the flight leader of the Blue Angels and the captain of an aircraft carrier? And that's kind of the story. And I also want to make sure that kids that are out there right now, that you can do anything. 
if you put your mind to it. And that vignette format is is what keeps it so engaging. It's just story after story. And uh, you've mentioned your upbringing, the one one uh, one room schoolhouse. You grew up on a farm, Portland, North Dakota. Your dad's farm, and you attribute a lot of the lessons you learned uh, growing up on that farm really to later kind of attributing to your success in naval aviation. Talk to me about growing up on that farm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, growing up on the farm. So, <clears throat> you know, by the time uh, the rules on our farm were, uh, you can drive a tractor once you can start it. Now you gotta remember back then it didn't have a key to turn to start it. You had this big flywheel that you had to turn in his old John Deere in order to get the thing to start. And so I was always pestering my dad about, come on dad, let me drive the tractor, you know, without you on it, just by myself. And he said, you can drive the tractor by yourself once you can start it. Okay, so we had this old 1938 Model A John Deere out there, and a hired man came in at noon to have a dinner. We called a noon meal dinner instead of lunch there because it was the main meal. And I knew that when, they, when the engine was hot, it was easier to start. So he goes in the house, and I go out there and throw a couple of petcocks, one for each cylinder out there, and grab that flywheel and turn it, and it fired up, but I didn't drop the flywheel. So it sent me say, smack right into the ground. And so uh, I'm told that my mother got a bit concerned, you know, watching what was going on out in the yard out there. But I, I remember puffing out my meager chest out there, got on that tractor and drove it around the yard. What I didn't realize is from then on, I was a contributing member of the farming team. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, you, I'd say accountability, you know, very early on, you were given responsibility whether it was milking cows or feeding the cattle or pigs or picking eggs or whatever it was, you were accountable. You were, this was your job. You needed to go out and do it. And so uh, we also learned to behave in that one room school. Let me tell you something. You did not cut up in there when there was some, well, always some class that was having a, their particular session. And so you learned to behave in that regard. Yeah, and then you uh, ended up going to uh, North Dakota State University, and you cite your guidance counselor saying that you were one of the most challenging students he's ever had to counsel. So why were you so challenging? And then you obviously then went on to a career uh, in the military. So at that time when you were at North Dakota State University, did you know you were going to go hop over into the Navy afterwards? Oh, absolutely not. I had no idea that I was ever going to be in the military at all. You know, so, uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, a bit on the immature side. And uh, Dr. Dale Anderson, well, eventually Dr. Dale Anderson, he was just working on his master's degree at that point. He was much older than me, probably early 20s. And so he uh, he was my advisor. Well, he's telling me that I need to take all these courses. So I'm agricultural economist, okay? Well, there were three phases of that. There was a science phase, which was full of chemistry courses and all this stuff. And then there was the production phase, which was more like a farmer. And then there was the business phase. The business phase had a lot of, uh, of um, finance courses and things. And guess what? There were girls in those courses. And there weren't in some of the other agricultural courses. So I would say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. I, I ended up with almost having a minor in history because there was a, I enjoyed that. And it, it had nothing to do with my major, but... I enjoyed it, and yeah, I was a bit stubborn. I think I'll share a little quick, quick story with Dale Anderson. So that was, uh, you know, 1962 when I was a freshman. So some, I don't know, 40 years later or whatever, 2013, I believe it was, both of us, Dale Anderson and I, were both brought back to get uh, Alumni Achievement Awards. And I'll be darned if he didn't stand up there and tell him, the whole world about me being his worst student he ever advised to. And so, so, so I got back up and, you know, and I said, you know, there was a, uh, an honorary um, agricultural uh, fraternity or, or group there that was, um, and I, he got up actually at this thing when I was getting into this, Alpha Zeta is what it was called. Those ag guys out there know what it is. And my grade point average was mediocre, you know, but not an egg. I did really well in that. And so he stood up and he said, well, welcome Gil Rood to Alpha Zeta. I did some research and I found out that you are the lowest grade point average ever to be in, invited into Alpha Zeta. So I looked at my dad who was there and I said, you know what, dad? 
So this guy over here, Jerry Bergman, a good friend and fraternity brother of mine, he's got a 4.0 grade point average. Never had anything but an A. Super smart guy, right? And he's an Alpha Zeta. I got a 2.86. But when we graduate, you know, we're both going to say on our resumes, Alpha Zeta. That's, uh, that is outstanding. And uh, just a little bit of the flavor you will get with the storytelling in your book. Uh, one of the other really humorous stories, at least I thought, you end up at OCS, so Pensacola Officer Candidate School. You got a little advice or tip. They give you a window, essentially, of when you can check in to OCS. It's a, you know like a multiple-day window, like three or four days. You got a little advice that, hey, you should check in on the tail end of that window. Tell me and the viewers that, because maybe a potential future naval aviator might want to take this advice from you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they say uh, your check-in date is Sunday, May 23rd, 1967. And so I had a friend who was fraternity who had gone on down as an AVROC, which is a summer program, and he passed on to me, do not check in until the last few minutes. In other words, 11, 11.30, something like that, when midnight is the last you can check in, because as soon as you get there, they're going to start on you. That drill instructor and everybody's going to be on you. Well, why? what guy who turned out to be one of my roommates, Chris Vischer, he, he thought, well, I'll just check in Friday and then I'll go to the beach and play around and stuff and come back Sunday night. And no, as soon as he checked in, they hit him for the whole weekend. So I was the last guy to check in. I got a little bit of extra treatment there because I was the last guy. But, you know, it didn't last very long. So that was the best way to do it. Yeah. So don't be first. Um, so you go on, you start training to be a naval aviator, and unfortunately, you're down in Beeville, and very early on in your career, you get a taste of tragedy that is probably all too common uh, in the field of naval aviation. And in the book, you talk about the concept of compartmentalization, which I hear a lot in the books I read and the people I talk to. So can you talk to me about compartmentalization and how hard is it to get back in the cockpit of a jet when you lose a teammate? Yeah, I don't know that it's so hard to get back in the cockpit as much as it is to concentrate on the flying part. This is dangerous business. Uh, now by now we're flying F9 uh, uh, Cougars, which are really a, a you know a frontline fighter type of airplane, or used to be during right after Korea. And so these things demand a lot of attention. To keep yourself safe. We had a, a terrible loss rate back in those days. You know, there just there was not uncommon at all for a flight, a, a class of four to come out with only three of you. And that's what happened to me. But uh, without going into detail on that, the book does, and it might find it interesting. The compartmentalization is required so that you do not have any other thoughts interfering with flying. Okay, the cost of that is that it involves all of your relationships with other people and whatnot. You just got to put it on a shelf when you go flying. In fact, my uh, wife, Barbara, at the time when we were, when I was a Blue Angel going forward, she'd say, okay, just stay away from him. He's within two hours of an air show, and he's not going to be talking to you. He's not going to think about anything other than flying airplanes. That's basically compartmentalization. Gotcha. So you do eventually get your wings of gold, 1968, I believe. And then, I mean, you're almost immediately deployed to the Mediterranean as part of an A-4 squadron. And then you come back and then you end up in the A-7 and then go to a deployment in Vietnam. So tell me a little bit about your early deployments. And then, uh, you know, the, the switch between the A-4 and the A-7 is interesting to me. Was that driven by the needs of the Navy? And was it hard for you to switch between the two aircraft? And did you have a preference between either the A-4 or the A-7? Yeah, I was, uh, the A-4 was a really fun machine, of course, just like when we flew it in the Blue Angels, you know, the, the airplane had a 700 degree a second roll rate. It was just, a, we call it the scooter. It was just fun to fly. It really was. But it was also pretty antiquated as far as its capability. You know, there were no computers in it at all, uh, just all manual stuff. And so uh, I went on a cruise and uh, because the squadron I joined, it was actually a BA-216 Black Diamonds. They had been shot up so badly on the Coral Sea, the, the crews before, that they said, we're going to give you guys a break and send you to the Mediterranean on the Forestall for a med cruise and then take one of the East Coast squadrons and put on the Coral Sea. So my first cruise ended up being in the Mediterranean, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> and nobody was shooting at us, maybe on Liberty, but <laughs> not when we were out there flying around. So anyway, uh, the A-4, but... It was getting old, and so there were getting fewer and fewer of them, and so we got word about halfway through the cruise 
that we were going to decommission. The squadron was going to decommission. So all of the pilots uh, that still had sea duty left, which I was one of, were then assigned to other airplanes. I asked for and received A7s uh, out of Lemoore. So we went back to A7 is uh, maybe not quite as uh, sporty to fly as an A4, but a much better bomber and uh, more survivable in the Vietnam uh, combat arena since it had was very sophisticated with computers and its bombing system was deadly accurate. Also had uh, great fuel uh, range. And so uh, each one of those, you know, had their own quirks, but uh, it's not that hard to transition. Uh, and it's very enjoyable to learn something new. Gotcha. And you had a really interesting relationship with authority back in those days, uh, which I found both uh, entertaining and interesting throughout the book. Um, you weren't scared to challenge a commanding officer or skirt a, a regulation or even get kicked out of a flag football team uh, game. So uh, tell me about your relationship with authority. And, and I think a lot of it you do attribute to what you coined farm boy common sense, right? Uh, it was keeping you alive. So it wasn't like you were just a jerk. I mean, this was selective when you would choose to do this. But uh, why don't you share a little bit more about farm boy, com- farm boy common sense and uh, when you would uh, maybe push the boundaries a bit with your superiors? Well, first of all, let's move back to the fact that I had no intention whatsoever of staying in the Navy. Okay, that was, you know, I was drafted. So I came in, I loved the flying, but uh, wouldn't pay too much attention to the rest of it. And uh, I had a particularly uh, bad relationship with my second CO of the first quarter. And uh, he and I did not see eye to eye on certain things. But I didn't defy, defy authority unless I felt it was totally incompetent. Okay, to where the decisions were being made were putting my life or my squadron mate's life in peril. And that is when I stood up for what I thought was right, uh, which resulted in a nasty first fitness report, to say the least. But, you know, it was also a bit of a, yeah, farm boy common sense came in a little later, but it was also a bit of Norwegian stubbornness and a really short temper. And so the thing you're talking about with flag football, that was just related to a short temperature, uh, (laughs) a short temper and a bit of immaturity there, which, by the way, cost me a night on the couch. Yeah, well, uh, and you brought out uh, you brought up your your late wife Barbara, and she was a big part of your life in those early days as well. But it wasn't easy, uh, uh, based on what you've painted in the book. I mean, it's really hard to sustain a relationship in the military. Uh, you've mentioned some of your immaturity, which I, I believe you admit to being some of the issue. But um, she was a huge influence on your life. Talk talk to me about that because that's a big theme throughout the book. Well, she was the mature one in the family. I mean, she was the one who raised the kids. You know, while I was out, uh, I deployed a total of 10 times in, the, in 28 years in the Navy, which at least six months on each one of those. And so I was absent much of the time. What that means is that your wife, uh, a lot of times they will say the hardest job in the Navy is to be a Navy wife because you are in charge of everything. I mean, you, you got the checkbook, you got the kids, you got to make all the decisions. And we did not have internet back in that, in those days. What we had was letter writing. Okay, so what you needed to do with letters was to number them because they would be not always in order when they came. You know, so you might be answering a question about something and it makes no sense at all. And so it could be a bit stressful to do that, but she uh, she was wonderful. Like she was a math and physics major out of uh, college, and she was a terrific math teacher. And so the kids, you know, they had all that background. She could help them and all that stuff. And once they got past seventh grade, I probably wasn't much good to them as far as just helping them with studies. Yeah. And so after your deployments, I mean, you had a number of different roles, including a recruiter, you're the commanding officer of the world famous Golden Dragons. You even had a a stint at the Pentagon. But then at some point you do make the decision you're going to apply for the leader of the Blue Angels. What what gave you that idea to go do that? Well, one correction there. Never served in the Pentagon. Got to Washington, D.C., but it was the military personnel command. I avoided that uh, five-sided wind tunnel any way I could. And so, so I was actually a detailer back there. And uh, after I was the CEO of the Golden Dragons, and by the way, the Golden Dragons, uh, that's what made my career because that was the best flight attack squadron in the Navy. 
And uh, not because of me, but because we just had the right guys in that squadron. In fact, of all the junior officers that were in that squadron, there were about uh, 20 officers, well, let's see, pilot-wise, there were probably about 18 officers. Nine of them ended up with their own commands. That's how good they were. So after having that uh, opportunity and then doing quite well, of course, the squadron did well, and then I ended up winning the individual tail hook. That's the best landing grades out of 100 or so pilots in the air wing for that entire cruise. So that was, that was that made me feel very confident and, uh, and really good. But uh, Blue Angels were never on my horizon, never even thought about being too damn ugly, you know, Norwegian, there was nothing going to happen. And so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, but the flight leader is a total different thing than the rest of uh, the uh, flyers out there. Well, first of all, you're 10 years older uh, than the rest of the pilots. You've already had command of a squadron, so you're supposed to bring some maturity to the, to the team, to the leadership. And also, uh, so it was quite different. But still, I paid no attention to it until I got a call from an ex-Blue Angel, Jim Maslowski, good friend of mine, and a light attack guy like me. And he said, hey, Gil, you know, I think you'd, I think you'd enjoy this, and I think you'd be good at it. And I said, well, you know, I really don't think so. But then I got a second call from Randy Clark, Pogo Clark, who had been on cruise with me in Ranger. And he was the uh, strike ops officer out there, and we got pretty close. And he had a pretty good view of all the COs and were out there and whether we could fly an airplane or not and so on. He said, Gil, he said, you need to apply to be the flight leader of the Blues. Now I took it serious. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and apply. And there were a dozen of us, 12 of us that applied. And uh, I think there were six of us that got become finalists, so to speak. And then we interviewed down at uh, uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, with uh, five, let's see, we had five captains, and they were the various training command commodores, and then uh, one ex-Blue Angel. And then the final interview was with the Admiral himself, which was uh, Admiral Disher. Yeah, so I got down there, and um, <laughs> I was... I was the only one who, you know, we all had mustaches back in those days, but uh, everybody shaved them off except me because the blues are, you know, they're, they're like in New York, Yankees, or <laughs> they don't have any facial hair. But I'd grown this nice red mustache, and I go, oh, I'm not going to get this job anyway. So I just went down there and interviewed with the mustache. And what happens is now it's immediate. The flight leader is chosen the day of the interview. And it's announced and everything's done. In those days, it wasn't. You, we all interviewed and had no idea how we stood in that after the interview. They took us out to dinner. And then the Admiral said, that I'm going to call all of you, okay, uh, those who didn't make it or make it. And the last call I make will be to the guy who actually gets selected. So fast uh, forward a month or so, and I'm in my at home, but it wasn't unusual in my job to get a phone call from an Admiral. Usually not pleasant because he was he was probably upset about some uh, decision that I'd made in regard to assigning a junior officer that maybe worked for him or whatever. In this case, and my wife, Barbara, she answered the phone and she said, uh, hey, Gil, it's uh, Admiral Disher. And I go, oh, what is he calling about? Oh, I know what this is. So I pick up the phone and I go, hey, good evening, Admiral. I assume you're calling me and telling me I did okay, but you picked somebody else. And he goes, nope, I've already made those phone calls. And I almost fainted. I almost fainted. I was so shocked. And then he said, at the end, he said, however, you better shave that mustache off tonight. I love that story. And, and one of your challenges, I think you hadn't been in an A4 Skyhawk in, what, 14 years when you took command of the Blue Angels. So winter training was not a piece of cake for you. Well, no, and so the way you do it, you, you've got to get current in the airplane. So once I was selected, I, I stayed in my job in Washington, D.C., but 60 miles down the road was the Naval Air Test Center. And so the, the strike people down there had a, a two-seat A4, and they also had an A4M, which is the Marine version of the A4 Super Fox. And so I went down and qualified in that, got back up to speed in that, and then before I actually reported uh, to that blues and uh, to start flying. The interesting thing about back in those days, now, of course, the uh, the new boss flies in the backseat of the two-seater with the old boss 
for several shows, in fact. Uh, and so you get a pretty good idea what it's going to be all about. Not back then, because all we had was a TA4J, which couldn't keep up with the, uh, you know, the super uh, foxes. And so I got one flight in the back of a TA4J with uh, Hoss Pearson, who was my predecessor. And he, just he and I, not nobody on the wing or anything. And he flew through the maneuvers, which were incredibly intimidating. Because, you know, he was making 200-foot bottoms off of loops and stuff. And I'm going, oh, I may have bit off more than I can chew here. So, uh, and we also had another, a, a little bit of a, a hurdle, a challenge there, because uh, in 1985, there was a bad accident where the uh, opposing solo was killed up in New York. And so, uh, Dink or Sean was, and so now we're down a solo. So the only way that it really would work easily would be for the lead solo to come back for a third year. And for many good reasons, uh, Andy Caputi, he uh, wasn't able to do that. And so now we had to figure out how do we get another solo in here to get started. Well, uh, Riz Watson, Kurt Watson, stepped up to the plate. And he was number four now. Remember, he'd never been in solo. And he jumped right from number four to lead solo, number five. Luckily, Andy Caputi stayed around unselfishly and helped us, uh, help uh, Riz and Hollywood Anderson kind of get their act together. But we actually went out early in December. We never go to El Centro until January, but that year we went out in December, kind of got our act together and I needed every bit of that. And then uh, we proceeded with winter training. Now winter training for a new boss is brutal. <laughs> if there's any other bosses out there, they know exactly what I mean, because you're not very good. Okay, and even though you're brand new, you're expected to lead all the briefs. So you've got to memorize all three air shows and be able to lead the briefs in all of those. So I'm telling you, there was no liberty, no partying or anything. We were out there. I bet you I studied two to three hours a night just to be ready for the next day's uh, sortie. And then it was, uh, you know, each of those flights like an hour and a half almost two full air shows doing maneuver over maneuver. And so you get pretty tired, especially with the field system, which requires several pounds of pull just to get to neutral. And so, uh, and physically, actually I was in excellent physical shape heart wise, because I was uh, like a 48, 50 beats a minute kind of guy, because I was a runner. Well, that's not necessarily good when it comes to pulling a lot of G's. So we had to do a lot of weight lifting to stay in shape. Uh, and then once you got the air show season up and running, 86, it was a pretty special year for a couple of reasons. But, uh, you know, in 2022, Top Gun Maverick came out. It's had a nice effect on air show audiences. But the original came out when you were boss of the Blue Angels back in 86. Uh, you guys got to attend uh, a special event, which I would like you to tell us about. And then uh, just did you notice any impact on the overall air show attendance as a result of that film? Impact was huge. Okay, and the other thing that made a huge impact that year was a, a, a video, a music video by Van Halen called Dreams. And you can still Google that or YouTube it. I mean, it was fantastic. It was a kind of a collage of, of A4 maneuvers from several, so not from ours. We were just benefiting from that. And uh, between that, then we were in uh, Washington, D.C., and we fly two air shows there. We fly Andrews Air Force Base or Patuxent River, and that year it was Andrews Air Force Base, and then we fly the Naval Academy. Well, the Naval Academy is a remote show. A remote show means you take off from Andrews Air Force Base, but you actually fly the show at uh, the Naval Academy, and then you come back to land at Andrews. And so we had been told that day that they were going to have a premiere of uh, Top Gun 1, the original Top Gun, at the Kennedy Center. And uh, our information said it was going to be 7 o'clock that night, coat and tie. Okay, and so, okay, that's going to be really fun. Well, we get back from the flying the uh, air show at uh, the Naval Academy in April. We are dripping sweat. It's, you know, 90 degrees, 100% humidity. And you're working hard out there at those air shows, believe me. And so we come out, and we're a stinky bunch of boys, you know, and we start walking in. And I'm thinking, here comes this limousine pulling up. And they said, hey, you guys are, you know, you got to jump in right now because you're going to be late for the premiere of Top Gun. They go, come on, it's 7 o'clock tonight. No, it's not. It's 5. 
So, man, we had to jump in. We couldn't change clothes or clean up or anything. So we jump in these limos, and off they go. Typical Washington, D.C. traffic, of course. We get delayed and whatnot, and we're like 10 minutes late. We go, good, we can sneak in the back, you know. We don't have to sit next to anybody. And I can smell the stinky, sweaty bodies. Or, no, they held up the movie until we got there. Anyway, uh, you know, they cheered. We all stood up as we walked out. It was really fun, of course. But then they put us in the front row. Fortunately, there was nobody else in the front row. But I'm telling you, watching a movie from the front row in the Kennedy Center is no different than any other theater. You know, I do like it. All of us had stiff necks the next day from watching the show. But, boy, did we get crowds after that. We got close to a million people at some of these uh, air, bigger air shows, mostly because of Top Gun and the Dreams video. Yeah, I bet. And I think they're seeing similar effects this year with uh, Top Gun Maverick. Um, and sp- speaking of that, so one of the big highlights for you personally in 86 was you got to go home to, to Fargo, North Dakota, flying air show in front of your home audience, which you detail uh, wonderfully in the book. But in the audience that day was also, I believe he was nine years old at the time, but the current boss of the Blue Angels, boss Brian Kesselring. And uh, he's talked about it in interviews, what uh, an impact that air show had in just influencing him and his life. So have the two of you ever sat down? I I know you guys are close. Have you ever uh, spoken as two North Dakotan guys uh, about that air show and just shared that experience with each other? We have. Yeah, several, and also with his dad, who took him to the show, you know, and yeah, it was uh, pretty amazing, you know. I like to refer to it this way, you know, there was two transitions that were done, A4 to F-18, and then F-18s to Super Hornets. Those two transitions were the only two transitions in 34 years of the 76 that the Blue Angels have been flying. Both of them were led by boys from North Dakota. You know, there's only 700,000 people in the whole state, so how does that happen? Well, it's a, it's a superior state. No, it really is. It's a matter of, there's a lot of interest in aviation up there. There really is. Uh, you know, for me, it was crop dusting. Uh, for him, just living near, uh, you know, the Fargo Hector Airport and stuff and watching all that. And uh, the difference, though, is that, you know, uh, he's this big, tall, handsome, you know, Basket, college basketball player, and, and I'm this uh, just every chugly Norwegian. That's the difference between the two of us. But we're very good friends. We talk quite a bit because, you know, when when they transitioned, the 1987 team, my team was the last transition team. So they invited us out to El Centro, and we shared lessons learned. And, you know, this worked well, this did not, because it's quite a challenge. And uh, people think, well, not going from a Hornet to a Super Hornet can't be that big a deal. Oh, yeah, it is. Those are very different airplanes. Yeah, and let's talk transition for a little bit. Um, getting a little nerdy here, but the thing that I found really interesting was not the the F-18 Hornet, but the other airplane that was actually in consideration, which is the T-45, which is a, a training jet, which I've, I've heard you talk about. I mean, the air show would look dramatically different. Can you talk to us, you know, how, how seriously was the T-45 considered, and if say the Blue Angels had selected that, what would the air show have looked like? Yeah, they actually, uh, it was more than just the T-45. They also uh, took a look at the A-7, which was way too underpowered, and, uh, and they were too much needed in the fleet. And they took a serious look at the F-14 Tomcat. But the Tomcat was way too big, you know, to go into a lot of smaller airports in there and also very expensive to operate. And so uh, the T-45 was considered. But then we looked at that and said, whoa, the Thunderbirds just went to F-16s. And we're going to fly T-45s. And oh, by the way, if we fly T-45s, we're going to have to be comparable to the other teams in the world that fly similar type airplanes like the, you know, the British or the French or whatever. And they fly nine or ten airplanes. And so this is going to be totally different. And so then they led to, okay, the F-18 is the answer. And uh, I actually had an opportunity while I was flying the A4s at Pax River to fly in the back seat of an F-18. And the control, the airplane was tremendous as far as the performance, except for the controls, which I'm going, there's no way we can fly within 36 inches of each other unless we make some major changes to the flight controls. And so that led to, uh, oh, we also had a little incident where we said, well, let's try this thing out. 
So we kind of lured this kid from this instructor from VFA 106 to come over and Pat Walsh, you know, who ended up as a four-star admiral. You know, he had actually had some F-18 time in VX-5, uh, a operational uh, testing uh, facility there in China Lake. And so the kid came over and he was chasing the team. And so he said, Pat said, you mind if I get in the front? You know, you're an instructor, you get in the back and we'll go out and play around a little bit with the A-4s. Oh, he stuck that F-18 right into the slot, you know, with the three A-4s and we did a normal loop. And on the back side of the loop, you know, he says, sponge is clear. And I go, what happened, sponge? He said, I was using full nose down trim to have a fuel system in there and I ran out of stabilator authority elevator authority in any other airplane and had to leave the formation. So we knew then that they had to make some kind of a change to that flight control system. And uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because let me back up and tell you how we got the F-18 in, okay? Uh, so we needed a second half, that'd be his decision. And that was John Lehman at the time. Thank goodness John Lehman was a reserve who's still doing active duty as an A-6 intruder bombardier navigator. So, I mean, he was right up to speed with everything that was going on. And so the cell was going to be to, uh, to the hierarchy and to Congress and whatnot of, you know, hey, you're taking frontline airplanes. I mean, this airplane just came into, you know, just got into the fleet here three years ago. And now you guys are going to fly it? And he said, yeah, but what we're going to fly is we're going to fly the uh, low rate initial production, initial airplanes that were flown by the uh, Pax River. And those airplanes are not carrier suitable. That was the trick. That was the, the whole trick was to get not carrier suitable airplanes. And then we added uh, kind of a BS story here, but we added, said, oh yeah, and by the way, if the balloon goes up and we go to war, what we'll do is to take these airplanes to the East Coast RAG, BFA 106, and then the blues will go there as instructors. And so that was how we sold it. And of course, all I had to do was Get one year of that, then we can start getting normal airplanes in. So I guess you're going to ask me a little bit later about how the, uh, you know, how the Pax River thing went, but that was that was quite an adventure too. Yeah, well, um, you know, part of the transition, and and I think a lot, even myself as a Blue Angel kind of historian or enthusiast, um, I don't realize how uh, imperative test pilots are behind the scenes. And so test pilots helped develop your F-18 demo. And unfortunately, um, you guys suffered tragedy as part of that, that, that development process with one of your test pilots. Could you share a little bit more insight to that for people that aren't familiar with the test pilot program for the Blue Angels? Yes, that was Keith Crawford. And uh, Keith was the father of the control system. He was the guy who invented the spring on the stick. We had to figure out a way to get, because you cannot, if you have normal controls in an airplane, maybe people don't know this, in the blues, it's not normal. You know, a regular fleet airplane cannot fly 36 inches apart with full overlap, sometimes 18 inches apart, safety. But you can if you have the right fuel system, which requires uh, the wingman to pull up to 30 pounds of pressure just to get to neutral. That keeps them from getting any kind of PIO like this when they're in close, okay? And so uh, how are we going to do that with the F-18? Keith and his team figured out that if they took the uh, ECM panel, which is classified anyway and would have to leave the airplane, it's right in front of the stick. They put a blank off plate in front of there, and then they hooked this spring in there that we could then hook to the stick. And then we were able to, they got much more sophisticated, well over this farmer's head. But anyway, they got to the point where we could then trim G into the airplane for what we felt comfortable with as, as we were flying the airplane. And during their testing, remember, they got to expand the envelope. It's a, it's a qualified developmental test pilot. That's a test pilot who has gone through test pilot school, okay, which is a brutal school you know, to get through in the first place. And then they need to fly the airplane, even though we blues are gonna fly you know, special maneuvers. So they've got to fly it and determine whether or not it can safely do that maneuver. And unfortunately, during one of those uh, trial maneuvers, they were doing a, a diamond roll. And for whatever reason, he was on the wing and they got a little bit low and he didn't catch it in time and went in the water. And uh, we had one other um, wild incident during that time frame that fortunately turned out better. And that was, you remember I told you early on the A4, it was 700 degrees second roll rate. 
Well, the F-18 only had a 260 degree a second roll rate, which is still a pretty good roll rate. But we needed to determine how many horizontal rolls we could do. We did four safely with the A-4, but we knew we couldn't do uh, maybe, maybe three. We knew we could do two, but maybe three. So his test pilot was out there again. And now he's, of course, not, not down at 100 feet like we're doing. He's at 5,000 feet. And he starts this roll. And, and when you're doing, when the test pilots are doing something to expand the envelope, you know, all the engineers are on the ground with all their uh, telemetry and their equipment and everything and cameras. And they're watching this. And the pilot narrates, okay, from the cockpit. And so when he, he pulls up, he, and he's going to do, he's going to do try three rolls. And so it sounds something like this. You know, he, he goes, uh, okay, um, here's a yug, here's a cancel, and here's a roll. And he starts a roll, and he goes, okay, there's one, there's two. And in the background, you can hear beep, 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 as the yaw starts to build up, and then it departs violently. Okay, and so and when it departed, he goes, holy shit. And he goes, uh, and then he goes, and you go, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, all the way down in the, in the background, you know, and it, 500 feet, he recovers. Okay, in the background, you can hear the engineers saying, eject, eject, eject. That would have been the end of the program if he had ejected out of there, more than likely. And so, you know, this much is, is the difference between success and failure. That is an insane story. Um, well, obviously, we know how the story turned out. You guys end up in the F-18 Hornets. Very successful transition at the end of the day. Have a great, successful 1987 season. Uh, one of the really interesting things that you talk about in the book is the fuel efficiency capabilities of the F-18 Hornet has much better fuel efficiency at higher altitudes. Uh, with that came some unique challenges because as you guys would depart in transit to air shows, uh, getting up to altitude wasn't super easy in the Pensacola airspace because of the high volume of air traffic. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the, uh, you know, the training command, uh, uh, for Sherman field there right in the middle of a, a lot of restricted areas because there were several training squadrons out there and, and they generally use the lower altitudes. And so when the A4, they they did kind of uh, step us up to altitude, okay, which is no big deal. And we didn't go that high anyway. A lot of times we stayed in, uh, you know, down below uh, oxygen altitude if it was just a, you know, a short uh, flight. But in the F-18, that used a lot of gas at low altitude and was very efficient at high altitude. In fact, we preferred to fly long distances. We could fly a thousand miles unrefueled as long as we were at 41,000 or higher. So we would climb to 4143 or even 450 uh, out of Pensacola on a route to a longer you know, distance to a show site. And so, but if we couldn't stair step going up there because that would just waste all this gas. And so Pat Walsh went over and talked to uh, the controllers over there and said, how can we get out of this environment, you know, and get up to at least 290, 29,000 feet, where from that on we can climb, you know, on a, on a gentler slope to get up to our cruising uh, altitude. Because it was 0.94 Mach, you know, up there at 450 and only like 1,800 pounds a side, so we did really well on fuel up there. So what they came up with was a, uh, a burner departure, all six of us. So there's two runways, two five and seven, two parallels at the uh, at Forest Sherman Field there, and we would take off with the, the diamond on one uh, parallel and the solos on the other, and we'd take off and the solos would join up, and as soon as they joined up, and the, and the lead solo would say, "You've got six, boss," and I'd go, "Burners ready now," and I'd throw in all of my burner, which we'll talk about later probably, which was about seventy percent of burner to the burner stop. Pull the nose up 30 plus degrees, looked at 250 knots, just held 250 knots in all these burners, all 12 of these burners, and we stayed within five miles of the field and we circled our way up to 290, and then we were gone. And so I guess it was really the sound of freedom. I never got to see it. I was flying it all the time, but anyway, it worked. And uh, one of the modifications that you guys actually made uh, when you switched over to the F-18 was uh, you obviously eliminated the Delta landing, which people love, but you did attempt triad landings, which um, didn't make it too far into the air show season. Can you talk about the triad landings? Yeah, what we found out was we, we thought maybe we could do a diamond landing. We knew that the airplane was too big to do a Delta landing because even in A-4s, 
the Delta landing required a 200 foot wide runway. And all the normal runways are 150 feet wide, except the Navy happened to be 200 feet wide. So anyway, uh, we knew we couldn't do that. But then we thought, well, let's try a diamond landing. Well, unfortunately with fly-by wire flight controls, you know, you get so much affected by the other airplanes back there, it didn't work. So we said, well, we can land triad. But that was pretty uneventful, you know. And so not on our team, but shortly after then, they, they got the pitch-up break-in, which is really cool. You know, you learn over time. And we, we, we of course, had to start out a little slower than that. But, uh, yeah, it was tough. But I, I was certainly one of those guys who was glad to see the Delta landing go away. And for all you ex A4 bosses out there, my goodness, that was a tough thing to do. You had to be on center line, okay, because it, it was just, it used up the whole runway. And, of course, the back row lands first, then two and three land, and then you get to land. And, of course, we uh, we had shoots in the A4. And, and so, because if we go in, we could go into a, as short as a 5,000-foot uh, uh, runway and just land individually. But, remember, we landed with the slats bolted up. So we were 150 knots on speed, and uh, it was just a, uh, it was fraught with risk, because if I blew a tire, for instance, it would sound like this, boss blew a tire, or boss needs to shoot, I'd say then, back row shoots, two and three shoots, and then I could pull my chute. By that time, I'd probably be off in a swamp somewhere, you know, but uh, I had bad dreams about that, still do today, you know, so I, I don't miss that one. Uh, and then I think uh, probably January or February of 1988, you flew over the Super Bowl. How hard is that to pull off and get the timing right? Uh, especially, I think the uh, the national anthem was done on a trumpet. Herb Elpert was the trumpet. And so, uh, um, let's see, Mark Bircher, uh, Birch, had just, he, he had left the team now after his third year, and uh, Kevin Lauber replaced him as number two. So Birch was uh, available to be in the stadium for the Super Bowl. And he had this radio called a brick. And so he could talk directly to me. And he could also, in the background, I could hear the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, so now uh, the rules were a lot looser than they are nowadays. But anyway, we were took off out of Miramar, and then we, we held over... Uh, Oh, kind of north northeast of Miramar there. Now I, I tried to get it timed right, so we left that holding and came in. And we came in over San Diego State University. And in those days, uh, the, the football field there was open to the east. And so, man, they could see us for miles. And Bertrand's in the, in the stadium, and he goes, they can see you, boss. Turn the smoke on. So I turned the smoke on, and he keeps saying, Bring it lower, bring it lower, bring it faster, bring it lower. <laughs> we ended up hitting that stadium at 400 feet, 400 knots. You know, so that was, uh, we just filled the whole stadium with eight, eight, with F-18s, I should say. Yeah, and so it was, uh, it was an amazing thing to do. And we were right on the last note of the Star Spangled Banner. And there was an article somebody sent me from one of the major newspapers, and the game was awful. I mean, I think it was uh, Redskins and... Denver, like 42 to 7 or something. And they said, well, the best part of that Super Bowl was the Blue Angel flyover. So we're pretty proud of that. So uh, a lot of the Blue Angels I've spoken to, you know, some are happy to move on at the end of their tenure. You were on the team for three years. Um, others a little bit more emotional about leaving the team. What You land for your final air show. You parked the jet. What were your emotions? Well, it was uh, mixed, you know, in the sense that uh, – you know, you're always the last air show of the year, all three years, you know, and the only advice I gave is, okay, this is just another air show, boys. You know, no lower, no faster. You know, let's just do the air show safe, you know, and then uh, we'll celebrate after it's over. In this case, you know, we did the air show, we landed, and we taxied in, and then we shook hands, and I thought, that's it. Because I had orders to go drive a ship. Okay, and I thought this could be the last time I fly a jet, period. But at, at least it didn't turn out that way. But it was very emotional in that regard. And so, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of relief in the sense that, wow, we did some 225 air shows and all this time and transition everything and nobody got hurt. And that was, uh, that was that's a primary goal. And oh, by the way, in the F-18, nobody got hurt for 14 years. 
after we had killed 20 pilots in the first 40 years. You know, so we're very proud of that. And a lot of that had to do with, uh, you know, just a better airplane and also with the uh, advent of computers to where we could do real pass down. Yeah, well, we're, we're about at time here, but, um, you know, you touch on the book. I want to let readers know your post-life, uh, post-Blue Angels, which you've referenced here a little bit, uh, including you were the commanding officer of the USS Wabash, which was a, a ship that would help resupply aircraft carriers. And then you actually took the helm of an aircraft carrier, I believe the USS Constellation, amongst other things that you did in your career that's very well documented. And then what also I really enjoyed about the book is just y- your admiration for your children. Uh, and and you have a very special honor that you actually share with your daughter, and uh, I wonder if you'd be open to sharing that uh, here with this audience. Yeah, so uh, for all you fathers out there, when your daughter's a senior in high school and you ask her, you said, okay, so you know you're a senior now, and you know what our rules are in this, in this uh, home here, and that is that when you graduate from high school, you have three choices. You go to college, you get a job, or you go into military. None of those involve living at home. And she says, oh, Dad, she said, you know, said, I'm going to go to Virginia Tech. I'm going to get in the Navy ROTC, and then I'm going to become a Navy pirate, just like you. And I went, what? <laughs> and, she, and I said, why are you going to do that? She said, because you never complain about going to work, no matter how early it is in the morning. And when you come home at night, you are uh, it's all full of stories and talking about how much fun you had. Why would I not want to do that? And she did. And she and I are the only father-daughter combination in the world to share centurion status. That is, each of us, or both of us, have 100 landings on the same aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise. I got my 100th on Enterprise when I was the assistant air wing LSO out there with CAG-14 on the evacuation of Saigon. And she got hers in Operation Desert Fox in Iraq in 1998. And so, and by the way, I mentioned that I won the tail hook, individual tail hook. So did she in an E-2 Hawkeye against Super Hornets and Hornets on the USS Nimitz for an eight and a half month combat cruise. So, yep. And she is, uh, I'm looking forward here to going to tail hook this year. Because she is a member of the board of directors now, an elected member of the board of directors, as I was for six years. And so we certainly have a lot in common. Yeah, I love that. And that's uh, one of my favorite parts about the book. Well, Boss Root, I think you have a copy of the book with you. Do you want to show it to the uh, the screen there so people know what it looks like? Here it is. Uh, so it comes out uh, September 1st, right? Yeah, can I make a comment about, you see that, uh, that's a Diamond 360 in 1987. All four of us were in our second year in the diamond formation, and that's the closest I think it's ever been flown. Uh, number Donnie Cochran in number three there is 18 inches from my wingtip. You know, very proud of the boys there. Yeah, well, I can't recommend the book enough. Uh, people can buy it on Amazon. Is that right, Boss Rude? I think it'll be available on September 1st. It should be available on all basically all sources, all major sources of, of books. And uh, about maybe a month after that, it'll be available uh, eBooks, Kindle, Amazon type. And then I'm also starting uh, your next week doing an audio version. So I'll be narrating 17 hours of audio. And so those of you taking long trips, uh, maybe I can keep you awake on audio. But I'm doing that specifically because uh, there are folks like my sister who no longer can uh, can read a book. And so I think there's a lot of folks out there that may uh, may enjoy listening to the book. Oh, and you've got the perfect voice to do it. We wouldn't let anyone else narrate that book. Well, Boss Rude, thank you so much for making time. Holidays around the corner, make a good holiday gift. And uh, I think people are really going to enjoy this discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>